Okay guys, today we are going to um, do essential question two. How do I design a controlled experiment to appropriately test a hypothesis? Now during the bell ringer we talked about what a hypothesis is. So now we're going to kind of expand on that. Um, the slide that you see in front of you is just a review of the scientific method. You don't necessarily need to write it down if you don't want to, but you are going to need to write it down. At, you, know, you need to have it at some point, so if you don't know it, Write it down, but you're going to ask a question in research, so that's when your observations come into play. Now remember that observations are information that we um, collect using what? Our five senses, very good. So we're going to ask a question, we're going to do the research, we're going to make observations, then we're going to form that hypothesis, that educated guess about what we think is going to happen when we do an experiment. Then we are going to design a controlled experiment. Now that's what we're going to spend most of our time talking about today after we kind of do this overview. But the key word there is controlled. So we're going to talk about what does it mean to have a controlled experiment. Okay, that's what's going to be very important for us. Uh, step four is to record and analyze your results. So we want to make sure that we collect all of our data and then analyze it so that we know what information we're getting. And then finally, we're going to draw our conclusion. So we're going to say, yes, it supported our hypothesis, or no, it did not. Okay? Now, just because if you have an experiment that does not support your hypothesis, it does not mean that it's a failed experiment. It just means that you gathered information that didn't support what you thought was going to happen. Okay? Any questions about the scientific method? more seconds to copy that down. We need to. Do you have any more time? So these um, are definitions. The, the first three, um, I definitely want you to have. The last one is the definition of the scientific method, what we just talked about that. So I'm going to give you some um, like shortcut things to write down. So just, okay, so data is the information gathered from making observations. So when you write it on your paper, you can just put info and some information. That's a shortcut that you can use. Um, info gathered from observations. Okay. Now, we have two types of variables that we're going to spend a lot of time talking about. Okay? An independent variable is the variable that is deliberately changed by the scientist. So you're only going to have one independent variable, and it's the one that is going to change. Okay? But you, the scientist, would make a change to during your experiment. The dependent variable, then, is the one that you're observing. So you make a change to the independent variable in order to see what's going to happen to the dependent variable. So let's think about what the word dependent means. If you depend on something, you rely on it, right? So the dependent variable relies on the independent variable, okay? What? Yeah. The dependent variable relies on the independent variable. That's something you could write down. And you can do like IND for independent and DEP for dependent. So you don't have to write it all the way out. But the dependent variable relies on the independent variable. So we change the independent in order to see results from the dependent. 
So it also says up there, it is the data collected as a result of changing the independent variable. So we collect data during an experiment. You're collecting the data from that dependent variable. And then again at the bottom, scientific method, it's a series of steps used by scientists to solve a problem or answer a question, which we just talked about in the previous slide. Okay. give you an example to go along with this. Let's say that a farmer wanted to try out um, a new um, fertilizer on their field. Okay? So if they, let's say that they grow, grow soybeans. Okay? So if they grow soybeans and they want to try a new fertilizer, the fertilizer is going to be your independent variable. It's going to be the one that is changing. Okay? They're going to change to a different type of fertilizer. So then the dependent variable, where you're going to gather your results from, would be the growth of the soybeans. Okay? So the growth of the soybeans is going to change based on what type of fertilizer you use. I know it's a lot of writing today, guys, but it's really going to be beneficial tomorrow for you tomorrow when we do the lab. Okay, so here we go. How is a theory different from a hypothesis? So we've talked a lot about a hypothesis and what it means, but you're also in science going to hear a lot about theories, and so we need to talk about the difference between them. A hypothesis is an educated guess that is testable through observations and experimentation. We've talked about that already today. So a theory is a broad statement of what is believed to be true based on multiple experiments and a lot of data, okay? So that means that scientists wrote multiple hypotheses, tested them, and then gathered lots and lots of data. Well, after a while, if they're all making a, the, pretty much a very, you know, a general hypothesis that's the same, and they keep getting data that supports it, at that point, we can call it a theory, okay? So it's believed to be true, based on lots and lots of experiments and lots and lots of data.
here we go. Okay, so when we talk about data, so in the previous slide I talked about how theory has to have lots and lots of data to support it in order for it to, believe, to, be, to be believed to be true. So let's talk about what data we can have. Now we talked about um, observations including data. So there's two, two, two different types of data. We have quantitative and qualitative. Now what does the beginning of the word quantitative look like, Michael? It's uh, numbers. Quantity, right? Numbers. So qualitative, quantitative, not qualitative, quantitative data is any example involving a number. So there are 16 desks in this classroom. That's quantitative data, okay? There are 31 of you when you're all here. That's quantitative data, anything involving a number. So what I want you to do is take 30 seconds and write down two examples of quantitative data. It could be anything you want. Two examples of quantitative data. So remember, data is information gathered from observation. Quantitative data involves numbers. So someone give me an example of quantitative data. There's that one smart word. One smart word in the room. Great. Quantitative data. Somebody else? The speed of something. OK, so like if a car is going 60 miles per hour, right? Great. Very good. One more. You're 14 years old. Perfect. Okay. Anything involving a number. All right. So we've <laughs> talked about quantitative. So now let's talk about qualitative. What does the beginning of the word qualitative look like? Quality. Great. So any um, data that includes a description. The grass is green. The sky is blue. This person is tall, this person is short. That's all quanti qual I'm saying it backwards again. qualitative data because it gives qualities. So go ahead and give two examples of qualitative data. Flag is wavy. Perfect. Okay. Anything including a description is going to count, count under qualitative data. Okay. All right. So you don't have to copy the whole thing down. So listen first, and then I'll tell you what to write. How many variables should we test at a time? How many variables do you think we should test at a time? One. So write down only test one variable at a time. The reason for this is that if we changed multiple variables, how would we know which variable gave us our results, right? So let's go back to my farming example. If the farmer changes the fertilizer but also changes the amount of water that they're using on the fields, how do you know which one is the one that made the plants grow more? Does that make sense to everybody? If you change more than one, you won't know which variable was responsible for the results, okay? 
change only, if you change more than one, you won't know which one is responsible for the result. So write down something in that regard. Um, let's see, how can we shorten that? Uh, if you change more than one, you won't know which one gave you your results or is responsible for your results. If you change more than one, you won't know which one is responsible for your results. Change more than one, you won't know which one is responsible for your results. So you always only do one independent variable. Remember the one that changes is the independent. You only change it, only change one at a time. Okay? Okay, so now we're getting to the part that's really, really important for our, especially for our essential question. It's all important, but this is especially for our essential question. Because our essential question, remember, is how do I design a controlled experiment to appropriately test a hypothesis? So a controlled experiment is one where only one variable is being changed. So underneath what you just wrote, put in big, bold letters, controlled experiment. Okay? Controlled experiment. You don't have to write this down again because you already have it. If you only have one variable, this is called a controlled experiment. So big, bold, stars, or circle it, or something. This is a controlled experiment. Meaning that everything else, other than that one variable that we change, everything else should be controlled. Okay, and would fall under the control of the experiment, meaning you're not going to change it. Okay? So when we talk about in our essential question, how do I design a controlled experiment? It's one that we are only going to test one variable because everything else will remain unchanged. So back to my farming example again. If you're going to change the fertilizer, everything else would have to remain the same. The type, like the type of seed that you plant, the amount of water that they get, the soil that you use, Everything else would have to stay the same in order to be able to tell if it was just the fertilizer that was making up the difference. Make sense to everybody? Questions? Okay. Okay, so just to kind of wrap up here, why is it important for a scientist to then take the results that they get and communicate them to other people? Why would that be important, Michael? Because if somebody else is trying to do the same experiment, maybe they can just look at that. Right, great. So in order for them to be considered valid, somebody else has to do it too, okay? You can't just do the experiments all yourself and then say, here it is. Perfect. Communication equals validation. Very, very good. Communication equals validation. So in order for it to be accepted, for the results to be accepted by other people, then you need to be able to communicate and accurately communicate what the experiment was, how it was done, and what the results are. So when we do our lab tomorrow, part of what you're going to have to do is take extremely good notes on how you create whatever your device is going to be. Okay? Because someone else is going to have to replicate what you did in order to see if they can get the same results. Then they're going to make one change to it to see if the results get better or worse. Okay? All right. <clears throat> Wrapping up here. So why do you have to keep repeating experiments? What's the point of having someone else do it? Well, the more time you do the experiment, the more data you get, right? So the more times it's repeated, the more results you obtain. And the results aren't going to be considered valid until they um, get the same conclusion every time. Okay? So experiments are repeated many times in order to see the same results are obtained each time.
So going along with our communication equals validation, you could also say repetition equals validation because you want to get the same results every single time so that your results can be considered valid.